Now, it's a pleasure to welcome Sandy McGregor to the studio today. Sandy and I have spoken before, and there was a tremendous interest by listeners in our previous conversation, but it was by wire, and so I couldn't see him. Today, I can see Sandy, which I've wanted to do ever since we had that conversation, because I wanted to see how big he is. You see, Sandy used to make a living by going down into Viet Cong tunnels. He was an engineer in the army, and he retired a colonel with a military cross. And I was of the opinion that only very small chaps should do this sort of thing, and you have to be over six foot. Uh, yes, Terry, hello. <laughs> I'm six foot two and a half. Yeah. And how much did you weigh? Oh, at the time, uh, 13 stone. Could you turn around in these tunnels? Not initially. It, it, some of the tunnels are so small that you've got to keep on going until they do open out. And then, when there's another room off them, you can. But then again, some other tunnels, um, uh, some four foot six inches high, uh, you know, so that you, you can turn around in some, yes. I seem to remember I put this question to you like this last time. This is a stupid question, but were you scared? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yes. So why was it necessary to do it? Why did you have to go into the tunnels? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, up until that time, uh, tunnels hadn't been searched out. They were, they were basically, uh, when a tunnel entrance was found, uh, tear gas, a uh, bit of smoke was thrown down it and the entrance was sealed. Um, what we did was we physically went down the tunnels and as soon as we did, we found intelligence and particularly in that uh, area of tunnels uh, in uh, the Hobo Woods. We landed right on the headquarters area, and we took out, for instance, besides ammunition, equipment, uh, tons and tons of explosives, we took out over 100,000 sheets of paper, mm -hmm. uh, which was intelligence that was... Uh, I mean, for instance, one of the bits of intelligence we got was, a hundred, uh, was the hit list uh, that the Viet Cong had on all the uh, the major serving people in Saigon at that time. Did you ever did you get into any of their rooms, the chambers where they were reported to have things like hospitals and yes. lecture theatres yes. and uh, not the lecture theatres as such, hospitals for sure, yeah. uh, ammunition uh, uh, making ammunition bays, those sort of things. Not as big as lecture theatres, no. Mm. Now, uh, did you admire their courage and their ingenuity? Yes. Yes, they're very, very clever, cunning uh, sort of people. How long were you in Vietnam? 13 months. I, uh, I think I might have said this to you last time too, Sandy, that uh, my feeling about this is mixed. I uh, am astonished and have great admiration for your courage, but I wish you hadn't been there. Yes, I can understand you saying that. Uh, for me, it was not a matter of choice anyway. I was doing what uh, my job was. I, I was doing what my government said, what my army said, and indeed it was a plum posting for me. I enjoyed my time there. I enjoyed the challenge of command and I enjoyed the job. But it was their country, not ours. Uh, that's certainly true, but really we were not into the politics of it. Mm. Now, these days you make a living teaching people how to realise their full intellectual potential. And yes. that was what we were talking about last time and we will talk about again. Um, and uh, just again a little bit of biographical mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your son and how he controlled his asthma and uh, how he used uh, the, the sorts of techniques that you now teach sure. in order to avoid having his leg amputated. Right. Well, Andrew... Uh, 13 years ago, Andrew was 17 years old, and he'd had asthma since he was a small child. And when um, uh, when we'd reached our wit's end, and he'd, he was ended up on cortisone drip in a hospital, I took him to a doctor who taught Andrew, using the power of his subconscious mind, to relax and release stress very fast. And Andrew started taking control over his asthma. It was like, yeah, I'm in control of this. You know? mm. And he immediately started to get better. And then he broke his leg in two places, bone shattered, sticking out, all of this sort of thing. And uh, the doctors were going to cut his leg off. And uh, it was then that um, I brought this other doctor in again and he said look he said what i'll be able to do with andrew is help him use his subconscious mind so that he can release pain using it and at the same time that means he won't be on cortisone because that inhibits the growth of bone marrow and he said he could use his his subconscious mind to help heal his leg this of course as you know was all double dutch to me because i didn't understand it but of course andrew did it and miracles of miracles he's got his leg and he doesn't have asthma now, my background, military, 
uh, through Duntroon Military College and then, of course, through Sydney University doing civil engineering. And you can't get a more left brain analytical person than that, I don't think. And, of course, I'd never heard of the subconscious mind, but I could see its power. So I said, Andrew, teach me. And that's when I started. But one of the definitions of the subconscious mind, Sandy, is that it is not accessible to intentional control. Well, I'm, I'm not sure about that definition, uh, whether it's accurate or not, because you can certainly put things into the subconscious mind deliberately. You can access it also deliberately. One of the things that science has found, and there's a lot of science in the last 35 years, since Lazanov, in fact, was... Uh, in Bulgaria teaching languages three to seven times faster. There's been an enormous amount of, uh, of development uh, of uh, the brain or the mind and or research actually. Relaxation, bringing the alpha brainwave states. Well, I mean, we've got an energy that flows through us which is measured with an electroencephalograph and everyone knows that now when that reads zero, that's the legal definition of dead, mm. you know, brain dead. Now, when, when the, when the uh, brain waves are in fact between 7 to 14 cycles a second, that is what's the relaxed state. It's the same as the daydreaming state or the same state we watch television in or the same state we watch a fantastic, uh, read a fantastic book in or something like that. Single focus concentration. When you're in that state and the brain waves come down, that allows you access through your reticular activating filter which opens up into the subconscious mind and all your memory habits personality and self-image is all in your subconscious mind it's 90 percent of our mind now um at the time that your son was applying these techniques, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what were you doing then? Were you an engineer at that stage or um, a retired uh, army colonel? Or uh, what no, you? no, at that stage I was still in the army reserve and I was a colonel. Uh, and at that, um, uh, at that time I was working as a, the national production manager at a, 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 at a Simmons bidding factory and furniture factory, that sort of thing. So, still analytical so work. When did you decide that you were going to turn what had worked in Andrew's case yes. into a personal profession. Ah, this would have been soon after my daughters were murdered and, and Jenny and Kirsty and Lexi um, were murdered back in January 1987 and uh, uh, they were twins who were 19 years old and Lexi was 16 years old. They were, they were murdered and of course it was my growth and passage uh, of, of what happened to me after that that I went back into this subconscious mind because you see there were two things that I did straight after I mean I went through the normal grief processes of hatred and anger and revenge and all of this sort of thing but I had two things with me one is that I had a group of good friends around me who kept me talking about the incident and about Jenny Kirsty and Lexi and this sort of thing and this is very important so that we don't push down into our subconscious mind uh, because that's where this is where traumatic stress comes down. If you want to push that down, the conscious mind in fact can forget it, but it, that's not working through it. The second thing is that I had the tool of being able to go into my peaceful place really inside my mind. I'd built a peaceful place which was a relaxed place and I was doing meditation. And I was into meditation a lot, and it was here that I was able to change the feelings of hatred and anger and revenge. And God, why me? You know, and I'd get some answers to these questions. And, and it was a message, a very clear message that said, if you persist in thinking like that, and you know, as a man thinker, so he'll become, uh, if you persist in thinking like that, that's, that will consume you and you will end up like that and I said aha uh -huh, I'm not like that what I want to do is I want to get beyond that and so I worked with acceptance love unconditional love and forgiveness and I did a lot of work on myself and it was after that that I went to the United States and then I met uh, this person who could teach Stephen Snyder is his name fantastic guy and and I was on a course uh, for six weeks uh, 12 hours a day really and it was during that course that Stephen Snyder um, taught us all in one day 
to be able to relax and release stress in 30 seconds. And wow, was I excited. Because at this stage, I'd already proved that, you know, I could release weight and bring down my blood pressure and, and all of those sort of things. But not, I didn't know how to do it in 30 seconds. Have you met the killer, your daughter's killer? No, I haven't met. Mm. No. I mean, you, you, you just talk about it as though it was something that you were able to cope with, but as you say, a mixture of grief and hatred. What was special that you were able to cope with it and then turn that experience into a vocation? I really think it was the knowledge ultimately of, develop, of, of knowing just how powerful the subconscious mind is and how the subconscious mind can be accessed. You see, in learning with Stephen Snyder the ability to be able to do it very fast, that was a way that I therefore knew how to be able to do things like accelerated learning, how to, do, how to get goals faster and all of those sorts of things. However, the deeper thing, which is how I managed to, to get through this process, was meditation. Well, that takes you down to what we call the theta state. And so it's in the theta state that you can work on yourself with things like, um, uh, well, meditation, spiritual meditation, or meditation for forgiveness, or those sorts of things, and also healing. So it's all still access to the subconscious mind. And I realized the importance of this. And it was then as a result of getting Stephen Snyder to Australia, and I worked with him for some 22 seminars before then, about two and a half years ago, I went by myself. You call your technique CALM. What does yeah. CALM stand for? CALM stands for Creative Accelerated Learning Methods. And uh, I suppose if I say what is it, you'll, you'll tell us what you've already told us. Uh, I mean, uh, no, no. Um, very briefly, the CALM seminar itself is a one-day seminar whereby everybody learns to be able to relax and release stress in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. How then to... Uh, it, it's associated with accelerated learning, memory, recall, focus, concentration, and then the ability to use the language and the laws of the subconscious mind because, I mean, for instance, the language of the subconscious mind is emotion. It was only proved in 1971 by Rappaport that it's the very basis on which memory takes place. So that's the language of the subconscious mind. And then using all of those tools, we can get goals faster. And the additional um, uh, seminar is, is the one that is on meditation and how to meditate and also on healing, how to actually do almost how to do what Andrew was doing some 13 years ago. Mm. And Sandy, you work with children. Oh, yeah. Because I, 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 I see a, a letter here from, I think, a 13-year-old who's, yes. uh, who's uh, ri writing in praise of your techniques. He says, uh, since your seminar, I have excelled both academically and in sport. I just had my first semester's report in which I got near straight A's in maths and English and all straight A's in Italian. Uh, your book is called Peace of Mind? Yes, it is. Yes, it's in uh, book... It's and in... people can find it in bookshops? Uh, no, not only in bookshops, also in the ABC bookshop as oh, well. Oh, well, yes. in the bookshop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the story of your exploits as a, as a tunneler in Vietnam is about to be published in a book called um, No Need for Heroes. Yes, it's... Uh, it's... It's moving into the bookshops very soon, uh, in, in the next couple of weeks or so. Yeah. And, and, and this is your personal story? Uh, it's, it's like a biographical story, but by the same token, it's the story about all the guys that were in Vietnam, uh, and it's their story, really. And it's funny, and it'll make you cry, and it'll make you laugh, and it's dangerous, and all of those sort of things, yeah. Yeah. Well, Sandy, it's been a great pleasure meeting you. Now, Sandy McGregor's book is called Peace of Mind, P-I-E-C-E, -E, Peace of Mind, and uh, the book about tunnelling in Vietnam or going into the tunnels in Vietnam is called No Need for Heroes to be uh, in the shops shortly. Sandy McGregor, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Terry.